Bulletproof Radio, a state of high performance. Today's episode is profoundly cool. You're going to hear from a doctor who doesn't believe in PTSD, and he's got a really convincing case for that. You're going to learn what to do if you get hit in the head. You're going to hear from a special forces Green Beret about his experiences with traumatic brain injury. And you're going to learn a lot of things you can do to manage inflammation in your brain. So this episode is one of those, you want to listen to the whole thing because it's just nonstop information that you can use. Uh, I had a fantastic time doing this interview. I, I think I think you're going to love it. So listen through all the way and get all the benefits. You're listening to Bulletproof Radio with Dave Asprey. Today's cool fact of the day is that there's some new promise for traumatic brain injury patients who have lost memory function. And you'd be surprised, there's a lot of people listening, maybe even you, who have had a traumatic brain injury at some time in your life and you don't even know it. We see sometimes up to 90% of people who are doing the 40 years of Zen brain training with evidence that they've been hit in the head, but they're still functioning, but there's something that isn't as good as it could be. It, it turns out in this new research, DARPA, the research arm of the Department of Defense, is trying to hack brain function in a program called Restoring Active Memory, which is kind of funny. It stands for RAM, which is computer memory. But what they did is they used electrical stimulation on the brain, which isn't that new, but they haven't always had the best results, and there's a lot of variables you can play with. The researchers here looked at those variables and figured out why. Many times when electrical stimulation is put across your brain, the brain's processing its own electrical impulses, and it gets interrupted, and in fact, it could even impair it. So in this new DARPA research, they figured out that using e-stim only when the injured brain's in the process of forgetting how to move to the next cognitive step uh, fixed the problem. So if they did the simulation right after they detected low level encoding states, recall performance improved. So basically, when the brain was starting to drift, they'd zap it to tell it to pay attention. And if you feel like you could use a jolt when you forgot something, well, it turns out you might actually be onto something and your brain would agree with you. I've used electrical stimulation myself for many years, and I think it's helped my brain to do what it can do today. Uh, there's all sorts of different types and all sorts of different research, but to look at what the brain's doing and then apply the electricity is something that's totally new and maybe really groundbreaking for a lot of the things that are happening in both healthy brains and injured brains. And speaking of brains, before we get into today's show, if you haven't had a chance to check out Neuromaster, the new Bulletproof supplement, you ought to check it out. This has an ingredient that's shown to significantly increase levels of a compound called BDNF, brain-derived nootropic factor. These are key neuroproteins for neuron creation and synaptic brain plasticity. Exercise is one way to raise BDNF, or Neuromaster can raise it four times more than exercise. I recommend you do both. That's what I do. You can find it at bulletproof.com. It's called Neuromaster. This episode of Bulletproof Radio is brought to you by Squatty Potty, who brilliantly has us all talking about pooping. Everybody poops, and their mission is to help you poop better one stool at a time. Humans were designed to squat when pooping, and two-thirds of the world still does. The Squatty Potty stool puts you in a natural squatting position for a faster, better, and more complete elimination. Your colon's sweet spot comes with the squat. <laughs> this is the only position in which the puborectalis muscle fully relaxes, and that's the muscle that keeps your poop inside until it's go time. When the colon straightens out, it allows for complete elimination without straining. Squatty Potty is not meant only for people with gut or colon issues. The Squatty Potty stool is the best addition to your bathroom routine to help you prevent issues and maintain good health. Get that toxic crap out completely and you'll avoid some of the problems down the road. I love my Squatty Potty and I use it daily, sometimes more than once. In fact, <laughs> now they have a travel portable version to aid with the miseries that come with travel constipation. Guys, I'm not kidding. I actually do have a Squatty Potty and I really like it. It sounds a little bit crazy, but it's totally legit. So get your butt over there and receive a 20% discount by going over to squattypotty.com slash bulletproof. Get your discount of 20% off by squattypotty.com slash bulletproof. I'm serious. It's actually something you should have in your house. All right. I'm super excited about today's show because we've got two guests who are, uh, who are pretty amazing. The first is Dr. Mark Gordon, who's a clinical professor at USC. He's a medical director at the Millennium Warrior Angels Foundation Traumatic Brain Injury, or TBI, project. 
He's recognized as a top leader worldwide in something called interventional endocrinology, what you and I would call anti-aging medicine, an area where I spent 20 years running a nonprofit. He wrote a textbook recently titled The Clinical Application of Interventional Endocrinology, which is about as easy to read as the title might suggest because it's a real textbook, uh, not the sort of book that you'd have out there, but th this guy's basically a clinical badass, you could say. One of the reasons he is such a thing is that he himself survived traumatic brain injury and has spent the last 14 years looking at what happens between mild TBI or concussion and hormonal dysfunction that changes your personality, decreases mental functioning, and even causes physical decay. By the way, I've had a couple big hits to the head, including a titanium knee to the side of my head about a year ago, and I did have to really step it up myself because I felt some of those changes happening. So I'm, I'm excited to see what I can learn here for my own uses today. And our second guest, who's on the show at the same time, is Andrew Marr, who's a Special Forces Green Beret. He received a TBI in combat, and he's a founder of the Warrior Angels Foundation, and wrote a book that's coming out soon called Elevate, The Way of the Warrior Angel, and he's co-host of the Warrior Soul podcast. So WAF, which is the Warrior Angels Foundation, and Mark Gordon are working together to correct just this huge problem of TBI in our, our veterans and in other people in general. And I, just from a personal perspective, I'm, I'm really happy to have him on the show to support WAF because so many people come back from combat who might've been killed 30 years ago. And instead they're not dead, but they're rattled. And they're not just emotionally rattled, they're physically rattled inside the head, which reflects itself emotionally, which is a different thing. So to be able to recognize that and do the research is, uh, it's profoundly important uh, for, for bringing people back, you know, all the way to where, where they're capable of being. So, guys, welcome to the show. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate yeah. being here. It's a pleasure, Dave. Thank you. Now, that first voice you heard uh, was Mark, and the second one was Andrew. And you can tell because Andrew just sounds like a Green Beret. I, I don't know how you guys <laughs> that, but... <laughs> we'll now, take it. When you see him, he, you know he's Green Beret. He's just towering. Yeah, Impressive. towering. He got the yeah, got the cool tower. got the cool tats, and definitely looks like he could squeeze me you in his it. bicep. Uh, speaking of watching him, if you want to watch this episode, you go to bulletproof.com/slash/youtube, and that'll take you right to the YouTube channel where this is uh, where this show is listed. And I want to jump in on on just the far-reaching impact of traumatic brain injury, and and to get there. From a, a clinical, from a medical perspective, like what is the definition of a traumatic brain injury the way you see it now, Mark, given all the your own experience and given your clinical well, experience? It's a, it's a great question because there's a lot of confusion about what really is a traumatic brain injury, TBI. People think that it's being knocked down unconscious or being knocked down, not necessarily unconscious, but waking up or getting up and being confused, uh, headache, nausea, and vomiting. What we're finding is that only happens in about 15% of the people, but in 85%, wow. 85% it's mild form of traumatic brain injury where they get knocked down and they stand up, they brush themselves off, and they go back into the game. Or you're watching you know, MMA and you see these guys getting knocked down, they stand up and do it again. So traumatic brain injury has a spectrum. The group that we look at is the 85%, which is the mild form. And what happens either immediately to over 17 years, which has been documented, is the initial physical trauma being hit, whether or not it's a baseball bat to the head. Yesterday I had someone who was hit in the back of the head by a hardball while playing baseball or a motor vehicle accident where they don't hit their head, but they are thrown forward and back and maybe the back of the head hits the um, back of the seat. And what happens over time is they start developing changes in personality, which again, can take up to 17 years. And what the underlying cause of that is a process of inflammation. So it's the inflammation that is now being looked at very closely uh, as being precipitating cause for things like OCD, depression, um, autism, bipolar, yep. schizophrenia, just inflammation is is the key. And that's why, you know, products like Neuromaster, which increases the uh, BDNF, is a significant um, approach to addressing the inflammation. Now, now, 
inflammation is something that I target in everything I do in the Bulletproof Diet, my anti-aging regimen, just after, after learning from many, many experts and losing 100 pounds of weight and getting rid of you know, the arthritis I've had in my knees since I was 14, anytime you see inflammation, you know, muffin top around your pants that wasn't there yesterday, that's inflammation. How do you know if that inflammation is mirrored in your brain? And is it going to be worse if you've had a TBI? Well, it is mirrored in our biochemistry. We have a panel of 28 biomarkers that we do. And the biomarkers are relative to how the inflammation interrupts the chemistry of the brain. So we do neurosteroids. Neurosteroids are the hormones that are produced specifically by cells in the brain, whether or not it's we call them glial cells or um, neurons, the, the actual neurotransmitting cells. And there are three chemical tests that we've now added to our protocol, which look specifically for inflammation in the brain and body. And one of them is called IL-6, interleukin-6. Mm -hmm. Wikipedia has a great discussion of it. IL-1 beta and tumor necrosis factor alpha which has been uh, focally looked at for causation of psoriasis, Crohn's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and there are medications that are out there, injectable medications, to adjust that one inflammatory chemical. And we have a lot of chemistry, you know, from glutens, as you well know, glutens cause inflammation. They create a cascade of inflammatory products that lead to the bloating of the body and influence the brain. The gut and brain as you well know, are connected. I know that if I do stuff that makes me inflamed, I, I'm much more likely to act like a jerk. Uh, and I, when I was inflamed all the time as a young man, yeah. uh, I actually did act like a jerk pretty much all the time. Uh, and so, so there's, uh, uh, in me, a, a core association between uh, inflammation uh, and, and me doing things that I don't like doing. And I can see right. it in my kids. They do stuff that, that makes them inflamed. They don't sleep as well. They look puffy when they wake up, and they're little hellions. And then <laughs> uh, most of the time when they eat the right stuff and they don't, they're not inflamed, they're, they're, they're the way all kids are, which is you know, they, they actually want to be nice and they want to learn and grow. So how do people know if, if all right, I, I'm feeling off today, how do they know if it's inflammation or something else? Um, obviously, uh having a physician who deals in this and having them checked out would would be the best way to do it. But speaking about this interleukin-6 and what you said about change in personality, there are studies that are looking at generic inflammatory diseases, for one, rheumatoid arthritis, for two, lupus. And they see a pattern of psychological changes in these people from psychoses to depression, and it's all due to a chemical interleukin-6. You get a cold. You feel smarter or less smart? Well, if you feel less smart, like 99% of the people will admit to, 1% will say, I'm brilliant all the time. <laughs> what, happens, what happens is the uh, interleukin-6 interrupts an area of the brain that deals with our cognition and where intellectual uh, quotient come from, comes from, IQ. So it decreases the uh, intellectual quotient. And a simple um, phyto from plant-based product called DHEA, drops the interleukin-6 production and can improve that fogginess that you feel um, during a cold or during any inflammatory process. So would you recommend that if people are feeling brain fog from a short-term, either short-term injury or short-term uh, response to an infection, maybe taking five milligrams of DHEA just to deal with the brain fog? Um, uh, we do about 25 to 50, and it's okay. all based upon laboratory testing. Five milligrams is a good start. 50 milligrams is a great area. Research that's been done at UCLA and elsewhere for multiple sclerosis, 1,200 milligrams of uh, DHEA to help treat it. So, so I, it chronic use of it, you don't get cold. I haven't, I've been sick nine days in 17 years. Now, I took DHEA for the first time when I was 18 years old and I'm 44 now. So <laughs> it's a while ago. Youngster. I, uh, and I, uh, but I look like I'm 30. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> but <laughs> uh, what I found was, was I, it, it actually really negatively affected my sex drive. And, and since then, there's been three or four times, because I'm an anti-aging guy, where I'm like, all right, I'm going to try DHEA. And, and every time, I, I grow man boobs, like, like almost instantly. So, so yeah. I found that in, in my 
own aromatization pathways. This is how our body converts testosterone to estrogen. Pretty much, if I take DHEA, I get estrogen. And, and yeah. like I, I look, I, I've, I've like, I'll grow a round butt if I do that for two months. Like it, it's disturbing. Yeah. So well, I'll, I'll just caution people listening, and I, I want to get your take right. on that. But just caution people listening: get your levels tested if you're going to go on DHEA, especially Anything. for longer right. term. Okay. Anyway, that, that's the warning. You don't well, want man it, boobs like me. That's <laughs> a good warning. In your unique case, there are two pathways that DHEA gets metabolized. One, the left pathway, we call it, which goes through endocrine dione to estrone. And on the mm -hmm. right side, it goes from DHEA to testosterone and then to estradiol. So in people who have an accelerated conversion from DHEA to the estrone, we give them seven keto DHEA, mm -hmm. which blocks that. And then you get the benefit of immune stimulation and more thermogenics from the liver and fats. Should so, everyone just take seven keto? I've heard like more, more often women should take seven keto versus regular DHEA. Well, um, women are more prone to the side effects of uh, DHEA. And if a woman only takes seven keto, she'll shut off her DHEA and lose the benefits. Ah. So you need to have a combination of the two. And again, you said it right on. You need to be tested before you start anything. All right. It's, it's, thank you for that. And, and uh, I'll, I'll just, I've got to say this. DHEA is a powerful hormone, just like taking testosterone. And you can buy it at Whole Foods. Right, so like this is one as a biohacker not to mess around with without lab values because you may it may take you a long time to get everything put back together again. There's no reason not to spend 150 bucks to get your hormone levels or whatever. It's not that expensive. Just do it. If, if you're listening to this, I'm gonna do what Dave does. Seriously, do that. All right, <laughs> as strong a warning as I know how to give, given the benefits that you talked about. Now, we've got Andrew on the line. And what I'd like to do, uh, Andrew, is is have you tell me about what happened to the extent you can talk about it uh, with your TBI. And really specifically, I want to know what it feel like when it happened and what, it, what did you feel in yourself afterwards? And then what did you do working with Mark uh, to uh, to turn your brain back on? And then how did that lead, lead you to work with Mark uh, for WAF? Because I think a lot of people listening who maybe haven't had a, a full-on you know, combat TBI or don't understand a pressure TBI, they don't understand what happens both at the moment and in the steps afterwards. So your experience could be really illuminative for all of us. Well, great. Happy to share it, Dave. And, and again, thanks for asking and having us on. Like I said, or you said at the beginning, I was a Special Forces Green Beret. So my specialty was explosives. And then furthermore, um, I was the breacher for my team. So I was charged oh, with putting <laughs> explosive, a surgical explosive charge on a denied point of entry uh, downrange in combat. So that could be a door, that could be a window, that could be a wall, in addition to taking care of impro what's called improvised explosive devices, IEDs. So I was literally over the entirety of just under 10 years in uh, Special Forces, what we call short for SF, um, I was in and around explosions on a routine basis, okay? And before that, I was a college athlete, so I played college football. I was only knocked unconscious one time in combat, and it was brief. And I remember I came to, because we were outside of a building, and I couldn't understand why I was uh, prone with my face down, and then I couldn't understand why the sun had just got blotted out, blotted out from the sky, because it was about noon. And I thought, oh, my God, I must be in a room or, or some building and there's an earthquake or it's collapsing on me. So I put my hands up and I realized really quick, oh, we're not uh, we're not inside. But I still I couldn't figure out what was going on until bullets started whizzing by my head and incoming uh, rocket propelled grenades uh, were coming in, which, you know, triggered me to say, oh, OK, we're we're fighting. So it was right back at it, right back into the fight. And we did what we had to do to get out of that situation. Afterwards, I never really had any issues, any noticeable problems or complaints until about six months after my last trip. And this time I'd been on uh, a number of combat deployments and again, never had any symptoms related to behavioral health issues, cognitive issues and the physical derailments that soon followed. But six months later, out of nowhere, I started the first thing that happened, Dave, was I lost all libido. And that was as a 32 year old, you know, young, uh, very fit individual, which struck me as odd. But I just kept on moving. And I figured, you know what, my body had taken a beating over the last six months and it's just going to take some time to come back online. 
But from there, I just got completely depleted of any uh, energy to get through the day. So as a high energy individual, zonked, gone. I couldn't even muster enough to get out of bed. From there, I started to have cognitive difficulties, uh, memory difficulties. Uh, but the really hard part to deal with is for the first time ever, my thoughts and my actions weren't in alignment. And I yeah. couldn't figure out why. And so when I raised my hand and I said, hey, I, I need some help, what, what that got me through the military medical model was being that high performer in situations of life and death, then waking up six months later, finding myself on 13 medications. I was an alcoholic. I couldn't go to sleep. I couldn't stay awake. My wife was nine months pregnant with our last child or fifth child. And she had to ask me if I could get, keep my drinking down for the day in case she went to labor so she didn't have to drive herself to the hospital. Uh -huh. And things only got worse from there. But that was the kind of cycle where it went from a high performer, no uh, prior problems with any of the things I just talked about, to <laughs> life completely off the track, uh, resorting to alcohol just to try to maintain some kind of even keel throughout the day. Did, did you think of it as a, like a personal or a moral failing? Like, because you just weren't trying hard enough? No, absolutely not. I, uh, based on past experiences, um, and I had this standard of a performance where I was set on performing and contributing to the best of my abilities. And so yeah. I, I knew that wasn't, that wasn't an issue. You knew that wasn't it. You're, you're a rare bird there. Most people feel when, when that happens, they're like, it must be me. Like it, maybe I'm just not trying hard enough. And, and it, there's a lot of guilt that comes with that. So you knew something was wrong and, and you knew it wasn't a core issue with you. You're like, what the hell? Okay. So, so that, that's where you were. And that's actually a really... Uh, an unusual and, and almost a kind of an enlightened perspective on where you found yourself, which is yeah. probably a gift. That's why you're doing what you're doing now because you maintain that. So, so what did you do next? So, so you're in a you're in a dark place. You're you know you're self medicating and you're me medicating with doctors. You you don't like what's going on. Your thoughts and your actions don't match. What happened next? Well, I came to a crossroads. My wife went to labor at the same time as our son had a genetic condition in his neck that swelled up to the size of a, of a grapefruit. We took them into the emergency room. My calf, my right calf had been killing me at that point for the last three days. Well, it turns out I had a massive deep vein thrombosis, a blood oh, clot in my uh, calf that broke oh. off into both lungs. But I, uh, I wouldn't take any attention on myself until my son, who had to go into emergency surgery up on the fourth floor of the hospital ward while my wife was giving birth on the second floor. So I'm going oh. back and forth at the same time while my son's in emergency surgery on his neck. Becky's getting giving birth on the second floor, and I have blood clots in my calf and my lungs, and I'm dragging my leg at this point because it's not working. And I was in such a uh, you know bad state that I remember being at my son's hospital bed, and I took the last lot and uh, powerful opiate that I ever took, and I chased it with the airplane bottle of whiskey, which was my normal. And I made my son and myself a promise, and I said, this is going to go one of two ways. If I keep on this same path, it's going to kill me, and it's going to ruin everything I love. So I can then decide if I'm going to continue to just wholesale take everything that the medical model is given me, or I can decide to act and channel all this negativity and hate that had grown up and channel that into something productive. And for me, Dave, that was I can no longer be a Green Beret because I've had too many head injuries. So I want to be a father again, and I want to get off this medication. And then I want to find a way to get back to my pre-injury status and help others to do the same thing. And so that line of thinking is what pulled me out of it. And I started to go outside the military medical model. I had to put in for, for leave because my unit wouldn't support me to get outside help. I had to, uh, we had to uh, get new credit cards to pay for all the different treatments. But I didn't care because I was going to yeah. find a way to improve myself. And taking those steps got us some press. Mark read it and he contacted me and he basically said, hey, we've been treating TBI successfully, not only in the civilian population, but in the veteran population now for a few years. He, uh, he uh, passed me some information, a podcast he had done with Joe Rogan. This is in, uh, what, into 2014. I never even knew what a podcast was. You know, I was busy <laughs> in, in fighting wars and doing whatever. So I just, okay, right. okay I'll listen. I knew who Joe Rogan was. Well, I listened to that. And he had a Navy corpsman on there who basically had, he was on 17 medications. He had a bad go in Afghanistan, got gut shot, shrapnel to the face. 
attempted suicide, heard Mark talk uh, through one of the media programs, got on the protocol, and within eight weeks, he was off of 13 medications and performing at a high level again. I can now say that that gentleman is, is uh, supported through the foundation, and he's off all medication and acting and screenwriting out in L.A. But that was the first time I said, this isn't special <clears throat> to me. There's an actual underlying condition that's been validated and backed by science. And if you treat the underlying condition just the way that Mark outlines, things get better. And that's exactly what happened to me. And now we have over 200 cases that we've held through the foundation. And Mark's done it 1,600 times through the, uh, his uh, civilian practice. So it's well documented. And that's kind of how we merged up and had the idea to bring this uh, on a bigger scale to try to help more people who needed it desperately. So, so it, it feels kind of like a software problem, but it's really a hardware problem. You, you fix what's going on in the brain. And all of a sudden, all the stuff that you thought w w was, was you know, a higher level or I decided to do this, I didn't do it, but, but it, it, it shifts. I, I, I had a similar thing. I had chemically induced brain damage from living in a house with toxic mold uh, before I had these other TBIs. And I, a lot of the same effects, similar behavioral things, um, you know, I, I, alcohol always just made me more inflamed and made me feel worse, so that was not a thing for me. But, but just the, the you know, your thoughts and your actions just, just don't align and you don't know why. And uh, when you when you address the brain, everything gets better. So, so when you hooked up with Mark, uh, or maybe we'll, we'll ask Mark this. Mark, when you guys first hooked up, um, to the extent you, we're not violating HIPAA or something, since you're both on the <laughs> line, you know what right. uh, what what do you do to to take a look at at, at a guy like Andrew who who has you know this this obvious history of, of TBI, uh, and then like like what was the first thing that you would do from a test perspective? And I'm asking this because. People listening are going. Maybe this is me. You know, maybe I didn't. I didn't go that mm -hmm. far. But but something changed a year after I I got in a car accident or whatever. Or I fell and I hit my head in golfing or whatever the heck. So, uh, what's the first thing that you did? Well, the first thing that we do across the board, regardless of um, the causation for their TBI, whether or not it's X-ray exposure, medication, chemotherapy, or a bicycle or a skateboard accident or skiing or water skiing accident or snowboarding, these are things we've seen recently, is we run a biomarker panel. It's taken me 12 years to develop this panel and to interpret it. I just got finished writing a software package. I used to be in computer programming. And it analyzes the labs and gives us whether or not the level of the hormones fit within what is optimally healthy. Now, unfortunate in traditional medicine or conventional medical thinking, is that if you have a range of a, of a hormone between 10 and 90, if you come in at 11, you're normal. Yes. But that's not normal, even though you have symptoms, because we're not treating the people's, the person's complaint, we're treating numbers. So our protocol is person-specific. Every individual stays an individual in how we assess them based upon commonality of interpretation. And then what we do is, based upon the results, we put them on a protocol that might address some of the uh, missing hormones or neurosteroids, whether or not it's thyroid or testosterone or in a woman, estrogen, progesterone, and then some of the supportive hormones that are not being utilized adequately enough, like pregnenolone, DHEA. So what happens is we put them onto a protocol. Now, in Andrew's specific case, he drove up from having visited a brain trauma center someplace in Southern California came up, drew his blood, and I did what was called a testosterone provocative test or provocative testosterone testing. It's a way that I can see in a very short period of time how well the patient will do when we get their testosterone levels to a normal physiological level. This is an anabolic steroid bodybuilding yeah. level. This is a human being, you know, a human's level, not a, you know, a steroid. Anyway, so I gave him a shot. He left to go back to San Diego, I think it was, and he had to hit the 405 freeway. Now, anybody who knows the 405 freeway, <laughs> that will cause someone who is on edge like Andrew was to explode, to lose it. He's driving on the 405, listening to music, realizing I'm driving and I feel nothing. Why don't you tell us, Andrew, exactly what transpired after the testosterone? Well, that, that was just it. For the first time in like 18 months to two years, I with, was without anxiety or depression. And remember, 
to me, I didn't have a reason to have anxiety. I didn't have a reason to have depression. So it just didn't add up to me. So I had this uh, fist coming out of my stomach at all times. And within two hours of that injection, pfft, gone. I was, yeah. it was like, I was back. Like somebody took a lead apron vest off. They used to wear at the dentist and I could breathe again. And I called my wife as I'm going down on the 405 and we had a conversation for about an hour. And there's the first time that we had talked and, and I said, my replies were just more than yes or no. And like in over 18 months or two years. And so, you know, that those were some of the immediate, um, improvements that we saw that just continued to build upon as we got the whole protocol going. But, you know, Dave, like uh, Mark was saying, like just succumbing to um, anger and rage as a response to things that just don't dictate that type of uh, response. And I remember once I was with my uh, wife and three little ones at a fast food restaurant. And this is just a good example of, of how it can get out of control when the brain's not firing on all cylinders. There was some young guy out there about 18 years old who was ma making a scene and uh, using foul language, threw his cup on the ground. And for some reason, I thought I had to write that wrong. So I went up there and I told him to pick up the cup. He used some expletives. I told him to pick up the cup again. He said the same thing. The next thing I remember was I backhanded him and he fell on the ground and I picked him up and I threw him into oncoming traffic. This is horrible, oh, horrible behavior, something that I would never do in my right mind and yeah. then that's when it dawned on me when I look back and I saw my wife breastfeeding and my two other little ones in absolute shock and horror. And I realized, you know what, if I can't get it right, not only am I in trouble and my family in trouble, people that I come across on a routine basis aren't safe, you know, and, and that that just depicts what can happen when this inflammation runs rampant and out of control. The, the testosterone thing is is profound because when I was 26, I went to see an anti-aging doctor. I weighed 300 pounds and it was a muscle. <laughs> and I'd exercise my ass off you know, six, six days a week, an hour and a half a day. I couldn't lose the weight no matter what I ate. Uh, and and I, I went in and I had lower testosterone than my mom. Uh, it was just in in the floor. And I, when I got on testosterone and thyroid, similar feelings like, wow, like I, I feel like myself again. Like, like I, I have the energy to bring it. And, and I've been on testosterone for about 16 of the last 20 years. I, I went off it when I was experimenting with the Bulletproof diet just to see how it worked. And I, when I first went on the Joe Rogan show for the first time, I actually had a little, my little jar of testosterone cream in front of me because this is bioidentical physiological replacement, not I'm going to get jacked, dude, right? We ended up not even talking about it. Uh, but it was, it was interesting because it, it's such a, a meaningful thing for people to understand. Testosterone isn't something, you know, for uh, for guys who want to get swole, you can use it or or derivatives of it. But it's actually a neurohormone, right? Like like it it's valuable uh, right. for men and for women. And and we're talking in in large part here about testosterone for men. But a woman who gets TBI, whether it's in combat or uh, you know just in life, is there a difference? I mean, they still need some testosterone. Does it matter, or is this more about progesterone for women? No, women need testosterone. One of the um lack of information for the general populace is the fact that we look at estrogen and testosterone and progesterone as being gender hormones or yeah. reproductive hormones. Well, it turns out that the way that we get 90% or 91% of our guys and gals uh, to stop being anxious is through use of one product called pregnenolone, which yeah. ends up dropping the inflammation in the brain, improving nerve conductivity, and they feel better in a short period of time. But there are other effects of pregnenolone, progesterone, testosterone, estradiol, and dihydrotestosterone in that it drops inflammation. We've now found that testosterone stimulates the immune system, specifically these cells called CD4 and CD8, which help defend us against bacterial and viral infections. And then it drops all the inflammatory chemistry in our body and stimulates the anti-inflammatory component of our body, which is part of the immune system. So what we're finding is not only are you getting the libido benefits, the muscular benefits, but you're getting the enhancement of all these other uh, pathways. An article that came out a couple of weeks ago, which uh, echoed articles that had been come out in the past, is if you're timid or you have a startle response, you know, someone claps their hand and you jump, 
or you hear a car backfiring and you see someone thinking that they're being attacked, like a veteran who comes back and they call that PTSD, which I don't believe in. And um, it's due to these hormonal deficiencies and they found specifically where they work in the brain. So women need it just as much as men. Dosing differences, you know, the amount is different. When you're looking at numbers uh, on these these panels, and, and by the way, one thing, anytime I'm, I'm working with a, an executive client, which I, I don't do a lot of these days because <laughs> I'm kind of running a big thing here these days, but, but just with Bulletproof readers and listeners, like if you're going to get lab tests, getting an advanced hormone panel is really important so you can see what's going on, but they right. always tell you, oh, you're normal for your age. I'm like, I want to be normal for a 30-year-old when I'm 140. Do you ascribe to that philosophy? Well, you're right on. The reason, okay. this is why we use the 25 to 35 year age group. Look okay. at a 25 to 35 year old, male or female, they're in tip top shape for the majority. That's because their hormones are at optimal level. And as we age because of trauma, because of medication, because of poor nutrition, because of lack of exercise, what happens is we start decaying in the levels. So when we take the blood level of a 70 year old and we see it now at 100, where at 25 years of age it's 800, we say, oh, that's normal for an 80 year old to be at 100. So let's put everybody at 100. When we take the 80 year old, I'll tell you, we have a 77 year old, and we put him onto hormonal correction, he's now in the backyard chopping wood in, in yeah. Boston, Massachusetts. And he's now having sex again with his wife and he's communicating and he's feeling calm as can be. One of our oldest Vietnam veteran that we've sponsored. Incredible improvement. Uh, so I, I love that answer. And, and, and if you're listening to this and going, you know, well, well that's cheating. You know, you're, you're using testosterone or whatever. Yes, it's cheating. Like you're supposed to die after you have kids and get out of the way for them. And, and unless you want to do that, for God's sake, yes, get yeah. your levels. And if your levels look like an old person and you don't want to be an old person, uh, then do something about it. All right, I, I'll get off my soapbox, but uh, okay. th thank you yeah. for saying that. Uh, now, when I, uh, last year at Burning Man, uh, I took a, a titanium knee to the side of the head while being launched uh, on a bungee cord towards another person uh, from 10 feet away in, in the Thunderdome. Yeah, that's I mean, this Burning is, Man. That's yeah, that's, that's Burning a very man. common TBI yeah, so thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it was, uh, it was worth it is all I can say. I, I, still, I still maintain that I won. However, my opponent, who, who shall remain nameless, uh, she, uh, she thinks that she won. So uh, <laughs> anyhow, uh, within five minutes of, of this, you know, I'm like, okay, I can't look into these blinky lights. I'm nauseous. I need to lay down. Uh, unfortunately, I camp with a bunch of anti-aging and, you know, naturopaths and also I went back and I, I took all the fish oil anyone had with them uh, right away. Uh, within 36 hours, I was on high dose of progesterone uh, as a, a short term course mm -hmm. for treatment. And I took every mitochondrial enhancer I had. Unfortunately, I manufactured them with Bulletproof. So 10 keto primes, 10 unfair advantages and anything to, to prevent that short term damage. Um, and I, I recovered faster from this than I have from my previous TBI, uh, much faster. And I, I did some neurofeedback to get my brain back, and I've got my before and after neurofeedback things. And it helps. I have $100,000 neurofeedback gear right over there off camera, and I run a neuroscience thing in Seattle for executives. So like, I have mm -hmm. resources that, that like other than, <laughs> I don't know who else has that weird stuff, but th this is the most valuable thing I know of, is control of your hormones, control of your biology, and control of your brain, because it lets you do what you're here to do. Uh, so that's where I invest way more than I should. But um, what else should I have done? And the reason I'm asking this is, A, I'd like to learn because I'm going to Burning Man again next week. Uh, right. and, <laughs> <laughs> but you're not going to get beat in the head with a titanium knee. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm learning that one. You know, I'm, I'm going to wear a helmet the whole time, and I've got like a sumo suit. No, I'm kidding. But uh, I do want to know that. And also everyone listening here, like, like if they take a whack in the head, which does happen whether you plan it or not, even if you're not an MMA fighter or a, a, a pro sports player or whatever, and we've got lots of those guys listening, um, what, what should a, a normal person do? Well, what you did was very right in uh, we found that acosinoids, which are the omegas, which are the fish oils, are extremely good. A colleague of uh, a colleague of mine, a fellow uh, military veteran, um, Michael uh, Lewis, uh, wrote a book uh, called When Brains Collide, and his thesis was on omegas. 
And we know that omegas have one component, uh, EPA, DHA. DHA is neuroprotective and helps to protect uh, the entire chemistry by dropping chemistry. In addition to that, alpha lipoic acid, uh, NAC, N-acetylcysteine, which helps the brain build glutathione, which is the key uh, yep. free radical scavenger anti-inflammatory component that we have in our brain, which rapidly is utilized to protect. So by regenerating it with NAC, it helps. The mitochondrial benefit, a lot of the inflammation knocks off mitochondria, so you lose energy production, which is called ATP. And when you lose ATP, what happens is you open up these channels on neurons that leak in calcium that kills the cell. So you need to increase your production of um, ATP or maintain mitochondrial functioning in things like CoQ10, PQQ, quercetin, all these things help to upregulate um, the uh, protective mechanisms in the brain and the maintenance of energy. I, I'm glad you mentioned glutathione. Uh, Bulletproof manufactures a liposomal glutathione. I took all of that I had in my possession as well. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Oh, <wow. laughs> yeah. All of it. And, yeah. and so, it, and PQQ is one of the components of unfair advantage. That's the stuff I was pounding. So, so uh, by the way, um, I write up a lot about ATP in Headstrong, which is uh, my most recent book and how you can hack that stuff. Do you have, other than your medical textbook, which by the way, some of our listeners are, are probably ordering on Amazon right now because some biohackers like me are like, yes, this is, this is what you read before bed. But do you have a favorite, like most accessible book about, uh, about this stuff that you might recommend for, for listeners who want to know more about that? Well, Interventional Endocrinology, as you stated, came out in 2007, and in 2015, I came out with Traumatic Brain Injury, A Clinical Approach, Diagnosis, and Treatment. There are 10 chapters in it, and one of the chapters is all about supplementation, and it tells you the science, references, how to take it, when to take it, in terms of supplementation. Then there's a chapter about the laboratory which talks about here's what you need done in the laboratory and here's how you interpret them. And throughout the book, there are a lot of cases so that if you read the cases, you can parallel it to your own experience in terms of either the injury or the laboratory results. So you can become uh, knowledgeable in what you should do uh, in case you get a head trauma or hopefully there's some physicians out there who look at it and uh, consider getting the book because we need more docs to help us in our network. We, we do, and, and I, I would love to see every doctor out there, when they're dealing with someone who has behavior change and, and this clear symptoms of inflammation like this, they should be asking, have you been hit in the head? And they should also be asking, by the way, do you have water damage in your house? Because you can turn on all this brain inflammation from toxic mold, right? Yeah. Uh, and the, the treatments are, funny enough, almost identical. I mean, there's some toxin binding you do with one versus the other, but turning mm -hmm. on mitochondrial is, is important. So what I'm going to do in the show notes, I will, uh, I'll include a link to the new version of that book so people who are listening don't have to, uh, uh, to try and remember it when they're driving or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, I, I'll see if it's possible. I'll, I'll chat with you offline and see if, if it might be possible to get an excerpt uh, to share on the blog or to do a summary or something like that because I think... This is the kind of stuff that, that people listening to the show, it, it's just valuable. It's stuff they care about, and uh, it'll definitely drive uh, a very substantial number of physicians listening to Bulletproof Radio. Uh, so it, it should drive some of them to, to just to add this to their tool set, because it's not what you learn in medical school. My, my wife's a good trained doctor, and they, you can always spell ATP if you're a doctor, but it doesn't mean you know all, all the Krebs cycle, because right. like, you know, we probably don't understand half of it still. Now... Uh, all right, so so now we know what to do if we're hitting the head, uh, which is uh, which is uh, just a valuable thing. Everyone listening. Uh, oh, by the way, whiplash, same as getting hit in the head, pretty similar. Well, whiplash is um, a called coup counter coup. It's an acceleration and deacceleration injury. So what happens is the brain sits in a fluid, suspended in a fluid. So when you have a whiplash, the head gets thrown to the back and then to the front and then to the back and then to the front. And that's how we end up getting frontal lobe trauma, which deals with our ability to make wise decisions, the executive functions, the, you know, the decision-making area. And in the back, it can influence your visual field. 
So you have people who have spots and, you know, funny sh zigzaggy uh, shapes in front. And that's from the posterior, the occiput, being hit in the occiput. And then their ability to forget that this is a, uh, this is a dog. No, it's a pair of glasses. Okay. Mm -hmm. And they can have visual um, uh, agnosia or not agnosia, but uh, can't um, relate what the object is to its name. And that can happen from frontal and posterior lobe, temporal lobe too. So it's important. Whiplash should not be looked at as a neck problem, but should be looked at more as a head problem with a secondary of the neck strain. Awesome. All right, so whiplash is uh, it, it's a, a head problem and, and to some extent a neck problem. But you said some earlier that that actually surprised me. So you're you're sitting here on the line you know, with a, a combat vet and, and you're saying flat out you don't believe in PTSD. Absolutely, you, you got you got to go deeper on this. Uh, that's uh, why I threw it out to you. You're a yeah, smart yeah. guy. You picked up. So here's the issue. If it really was PTSD then why are there 154 veteran suicides a week? They're all on the medication. Why are they still having an issue with suicide? These are anti-suicide, anti-depression medications. Why? Because the medication is not addressing the real issue. This is not a psychiatric issue. If you look at the Department of Defense's definition of PTSD, it's someone who has been exposed visualizing or seeing, you know, visualizing a, uh, a very negative situation, someone getting blown up, someone getting shot, uh, themselves getting shot. This creates a psychiatric issue, but we're forgetting the very basic issue. There's head trauma associated with every single one of these guys. When we go back, the 200 people that we've seen, plus the 1,400 civilians, each one of them has had one form of another of head trauma. So what happens is, and the analogy I use, if I may, is you have a slow leak in a tire and mm -hmm. you fill it up. You stop at the gas station, you fill it up periodically and then you go back onto the freeway. You drive. It gets a little bit low. You go and fill it up again. And now you're on the freeway. It's hot outside. The asphalt's hot and the tire blows and you turn into the center divider and your car blows up and you're dead. OK, you could have treated it at the beginning when it was a pinhole leak in it, or you can wait until the PTSD develops and you crash your system. This is a continuum of TBI, traumatic brain injury. The inflammation slowly eats away at connectivity between the brain that regulates how you respond to external uh, scenarios. Uh, the limbic system and the amygdala are areas of the brain that when I say to you, hello, you don't go chasing after me or the guy throws the cup on the floor and you don't go and pick him up and throw him into oncoming traffic. When there's disruption of the control mechanism in the brain, the CPU, you talked about RAM. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about the brain is the CPU. If you break lines or you don't have the throughput and the output in the CPU, you can't communicate with your peripherals. Got it. Okay. So if you have a hardware problem, you you can get symptoms of PTSD, but but the I've I've spent a lot of time with people who have especially early childhood trauma, right? And and the brain end of the day, the prefrontal cortex is it's a pattern matching system that that is is profoundly powerful. And and if you get a, a pattern match that says when you see a pattern like this, it's a life threatening situation, but it's not. You can take someone who has that if you believe that definition of PTSD. You can put them through EMDR. You can teach them heart rate variability training. Mm -hmm. You can put them through neurofeedback, which is, is my favorite tool for that kind of stuff. And you can reset the pattern so that they no longer have physiological signs of stress, like changes in heart rate variability that, or changes uh, into a more of a beta uh, EEG state. Like, is, isn't there some pattern association with PTSD that's different from a hardware-caused PTSD? Are there two flavors of it? Or you just flat out believe it's always hardware? I believe it's uh, in 99% of the time it's hardware. Yes, you'll have someone who says, I've never had head trauma, which I see on a weekly basis. And then when I get their lab results and it says, you've had head trauma, and they stop and they think, oh yeah, when I was three years of age, I fell off the first balcony, you know? So the head trauma okay. is the predecessor 
for the predisposing factor for developing what we call PTSD. It's because we missed uh. the process that happens poco a poco, little by little, that eats away at the brain and allows for, I just said that uh, they've now autism, uh, bipolar, OCD, schizophrenia, all inflammatory based, depression, mm -hmm. anxiety, inflammation. Where's the inflammation coming from? Because I saw someone shot or I saw someone nah. get into a, I, that's what caused the change in my brain to be inflamed? No, you have to have a hardware physical trauma. So, so you're saying that that uh, a hard that a, a, the trauma or potentially chemically induced trauma, but something that causes uh, that, that causes inflammation in the brain is a requirement for people to then have these pattern mismatches that they can't sort through normally. Absolutely, that's right. the bottom that, line. That's a very very interesting and intriguing perspective because I I see when people turn down inflammation in the brain, somehow they can radically work through stuff that they were stuck on before. But right. the tools that can, uh, maybe they're just addressing symptoms, but things like EMDR, I've seen people with profound inability to function do one session, an EMDR, if you're listening and you haven't heard me talk about it in another episode, it's a, a form of therapy where you move your eyes in a certain way that puts your brain in a reset mode so you can sort of see what the trauma was like and, and break the pattern that you're in. And it, okay. it can be really effective, but you're saying that they only had to do that because there's a pre-existing inflammation in the there's brain. There's a pre-existing, okay. and when I, you I can buy teach that. people when you teach people meditation or you use the QEED or you do electro stimulation of the brain, yeah. what'll happen is it'll temporarily improve the situation, whether or not it's by dropping cortisol level. Cortisol mm -hmm. just increases the inflammation and irritation. It drops the thyroid hormone and it drops testosterone. So in dropping those two, you have a sudden improvement. I mean, you have a, an acute improvement uh, in the condition, I was keynote speaker at the International Symposium for Neurofeedback and Research and gave a lecture, which is online on our system, which talked about every single one of the psychiatric labels that we have and their association in the medical literature, in the peer-reviewed literature of hormonal relationship to it the testosterone in 310,000 articles in depression, the 103,000 articles with estrogen and depression, growth hormone depression, all these articles. So they're using the QEED and they're getting good response after 40 sessions, after you know some incredible amount, 80, 80 sessions. And then they have some people who don't hold it. And once they uh, put them onto hormonal correction, they need less sessions and they hold it a lot longer. So all these other modalities have benefits, but you have to make sure that the fundamental foundation of the <laughs> hormones in the brain are correct. I, I'm absolutely loving this. Uh, part, of the, part of the protocols we do at 40 Years of Zen is a five-day intensive neurofeedback thing, but we have a, a chef on site cooking stuff with brain octane, which raises ketones, which lower, you know, ketones lower inflammation in the brain, increase mitochondrial function. They're on a full stack of mitochondrial enhancers because I can get two to three times more neurofeedback sessions per day before they crash and because like people get results better. So you just That's explained it. something. I, I, I couldn't tell you all the reasons, but I, I knew some of them, but you just, you just filled in a few missing pieces of knowledge for me about why it works when you're doing all the mitochondrial enhancement. Uh, versus not. So what, what you're saying, and it matches our data, we, we can see on a 24 channel clinical scan, oh, when you hit the head and say, I don't know, and you ask them three times, and they're like, yeah, when I was three, I, my mom dropped me, or, or whatever, <laughs> and it, it's just old stuff, or maybe it's recent stuff, but it, it does matter. And, and so one thing that a good neurofeedback tech will do uh, is you know, they'll, they'll run different protocols to show the brain this is what's going on in there. But you're saying if you don't address the inflammation in the first place, the, those things don't work as effectively. It takes a Correct. lot more sessions. Well, I, I think hallelujah. It, so I, I, I'm starting to agree with you. I thought I was going to have to yell at you about saying PTSD wasn't real. But you can saying, yell at I, me. I you, don't care. I, I actually don't. Yeah, I, I've dealt with my brain inflammation. I don't need to yell about this kind of stuff. But uh, there was a time I'd be like, what? Uh, but uh, I, I, I get what you're saying. And I think for, for people listening, if you have inflammation in your body, you have inflammation in your brain. If you smacked your head, you got inflammation in your brain. Anything you do that increases mitochondrial function throughout your body will reduce inflammation. Inflammation is a byproduct of poor mitochondrial function. Uh, and in your practice, 
Uh, and in your, your research at USC, Mark, what are the, the top inflammatory things that people are doing uh, that, that are working against their brain? Well, first off, I'm no longer at USC. Oh, sorry. Okay. I, I, I saw USC on that. So right. thank you yeah, for correcting me there. <laughs> in the past. Uh, it happened, um, what, last uh, two months ago. Oh, okay. okay. Which is fine. They were a great uh, institute to be associated with. Um, what are the things that people do that increase inflammation? First off is glutens and their microbiome in their gut. They're not, <laughs> taking, they're not taking care of the gut. Now, I'll be I'll break right here and tell you that my daughter, who's a naturopathic, I have three daughters. My daughter, who's naturopathic, Allison Gordon, is the one who put me on to you. And she said, oh, you cool. got to go and talk to him. You got to go talk to him. You guys will get along great. Uh, he's in the microbiome. Her specialty is the microbiome and brain. So she works as a consultant uh, with us, with the Warrior Angel Foundation. So it's all about fixing the gut. So you need your probiotics. You need to stop the junk you're taking, the processed chemicals that we're taking that only add inflammation to the lining of the gut, which releases interleukin-6 and tumor necrosis factor that goes right into the brain and starts this incredible cascade in the brain. Alcohol, excessive alcohol, cigarette smoking, not doing exercising. Uh, I like my, you know, my one cup of yogurt a week. So I've cut down on my dairy a lot, but you know, some of the yeah. dairy isn't good unless you're eating goat, you know, goat based stuff, which I don't particularly like. So anyway, so nutrition, poor nutrition, poor exercise, consumption of the wrong things, a lot of antibiotics, people, you know, yep. I've got a viral infection. Give me an antibiotic. <laughs> uh, exposure to dental x-rays, even taking the Panavex, uh, Panarex of the, the mouth can lead to damage to the area of the brain called the hypothalamus that controls the pituitary. So you have to be careful about that. So um, the mold is an incredible thing. Your black mold, your aspergillus mold and everything. I, I've got a quick, I got a quick plug there for you and for listeners. The mold thing took years uh, of functional time away from me. Moldymovie.com is a documentary that you will love. I interviewed 12 doctors and 12 people who had it. Anytime you have someone who doesn't believe you and you say mold, you tell them to watch that movie, they will, uh, they'll understand. Like, like, like it, it shows the personality changes and all that that come from inflammation. So if that's not in your tool set to convince the recalcitrant patient, you got to have it. Uh, and for people listening, if you, you don't know about this, I don't talk about it that much, but it, it was a huge project, moldymovie.com. I, 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 it's either free or we charge you like four bucks or something, but it's like it's the most important movie I can imagine. So anyway, I'll get off my, my soapbox there. Keep going. Yeah. Well, that's good to, <laughs> good to know. So. Okay. So, so that, that was your, that was your, your big list there, the, the things that are causing inflammation there. And I'm, right. thank you for putting mold on there. Mercury amalgams, is that as big a problem as people say? Uh, half my family are dentists and they'll, they're pulling out the amalgams. Um, okay. But one of the things that uh, we're seeing in our veterans coming back is that a lot of them have uh, mercury or lead toxicity and yeah. that interrupts the cascade of hormones from, you know, pregnenolone DHEA stops the uh, progression of DHEA to testosterone, as well as, you know, mood, brain function, uh, energy level. It interrupts, it inhibits it. So it's very important to have that checked. Now, I'm going to ask a real controversial question here. Aluminum. Okay. Got it. Uh, uh, so the reason it's controversial is when aluminum is used as an adjuvant in certain vaccines, uh, it, it's there to cause inflammation. Is that something people, uh, adults who get vaccines ought to be worried about? Kids? Um, I'm not asking you to say vaccines are bad. I'm just saying, is aluminum <laughs> in vaccines Shucks! bad, right? You just took away my power there. Okay. okay. <laughs> I don't uh, put you on the spot. You're a doctor. Yeah. I, I, I get it. Well, you know, uh, aluminum in Alzheimer's disease, I'll talk about that. And then as adjuvant, um, you know, to enhance the way that an immunization works, you need to really shake up the immune system. That's why they have things like DPT, so that they work together and they stimulate an overwhelming amount of inflammation in the tissue that goes into the brain and creates its own problems. So from the standpoint of... Uh, 15 years ago, if not more, they said, stop using aluminum because it's associated with Alzheimer's disease. 
That's not the case. What it turns out is that zinc deficiency, when you're zinc deficient, your body automatically uh, absorbs al al um, aluminum as sort of like a replacement, and that's how you get the accumulation in the brain. But the reason why uh, zinc deficiency increases Alzheimer's is because zinc is an important component to stop Alzheimer's, just yeah. like testosterone is, estradiol is, pregnenolone, progesterone are. So aluminum Beautiful. has its place. Now, I, I, I'm, I want to switch gears and ask Andrew a question. So Andrew, I, I've had the opportunity to talk with uh, various special forces guys uh, Navy SEALs and, and you know, people who are, are pretty, pretty heavy duty operators. And almost to a T, they've described more than one time a night of intense alcohol followed by rehydration with a couple bags of IV saline and then going back out. <laughs> right? So, like, there's, there's lifestyle factors that are part of being in the military. Uh, you know, when, when you're, you're just, you know, running at full speed and it is life and death on a regular basis and it goes from, I don't know, like, like nothing to someone shooting at me and then back. Do you see the, the, the food situation in the military um, and, you know, alcohol and other things like that as being something that maybe made your TBI worse or maybe is, is this a systemic problem in what's going on in the military or is that something that's shifted over the last few years? Yeah, it's a great question, Dave. I do think it's a systemic problem. If you look at nutrition, meals ready to eat. Good God. <laughs> these are things that are like 50 to 75 grams of sugar, and it's all processed. And so if somebody is getting a good dose of that over a six-month period, they have other environmental toxins. Maybe they're close to a burn pit. You know what I mean? Maybe uh, yeah. all the uh, heavy metals that were released from discharging weapons Nonstop. Yeah, depleted uranium kind of stuff. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So even even the food that uh, they cook, okay, it's um, it's hot. It produces inflammation, just like we were talking about. So these things do not set up the people that we send in harm's way. They does not set them up for success. It makes them more susceptible to brain injuries and chronic inflammation. So uh, th that's something that, that just drives me nuts because, uh, you know, it, it's, it's an active service. They don't pay you so well in the military. Uh, and it, you go out there, they invest a lot in a soldier. <laughs> and then they, they save a few pennies on food. <laughs> and you can take someone not just out of military service, but you can mess up their brain for the rest of their life because you saved, you know, a nickel on an MRE by substituting even more margarine for the one monounsaturated fat that was left in there kind of thing. And it, it just, it feels like somewhere an accountant, not a doctor, is making those decisions. And I, I'm, I'm really hoping that when, when they get a holistic view, maybe using machine learning or something, and just saying, you know what? Investing in food for troops is one of the cheapest ways to have troop readiness <laughs> and to cut costs in the military. I sure hope they get there because, man, I, I see that. Uh, so so you, you saw that as well in your service. Cool. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, now that's why we're working so hard to get this information out there. Like in yeah. my last deployment day of 2013, there's just there was no talk about brain health or, you know, uh, good cognitive brain functioning. Now we've put out a, just a plethora of information through stuff that you're doing and, and other like minded people where that's no longer the case. Individuals can take the power back and make their own decisions and, and say, I'm going to take these uh, precautions to set myself up for success. Well, what do both of you think about uh, mild ketosis as a, a thing to do? I, I know guys who are in deployment who, you know, order a brain octane, which is a, a product we make that increases ketone levels after you take it. It's a source of exogenous ketones. So there's always some background ketones present. I, I do it every day. I give it to my kids. Um, is that, is, is there something to be said for mild ketosis or, or extreme ketosis when you're dealing with TBI or when you want to prevent TBI? Uh, I'll tell you my version of it. Um, yeah. Ketosis uh, has a benefit, and that benefit is removing what we call reactive oxygen species, which are free radicals. And in, in normal metabolism, which is the mitochondria producing ATP, the energy, it spins off these inflammatory products called reactive oxygen species, reactive nitrogen species. Mm -hmm. And it's believed that that is harmful to a brain with TBI. 
So putting someone into mild ketosis has a benefit of dropping that. That's on the traditional conventional side that Andrew and I have this conversation quite often. On my side, when you starve the brain of sugar, which is what it runs on, you run the risk of causing your cells to die faster because yep. the mitochondria needs carbohydrates to run and make the ATP. So from one side, you're stopping the reactive oxygen species that can lead to damage. On the other side, you're starving the cell that causes the damage. So well, well, your, your brain cells can all run on ketones, not sugar, right? Oh yeah, they can. But if you're talking about someone with a traumatic brain injury, they're not in the healthy range. They're now in the damaged <laughs> range. And it's, you know, it's like uh, putting a ton onto a car with no tires. You're not going yeah. anywhere. I can tell you what I did after I hit my head. I did not cut sugar. I, I don't normally eat sugar, but I didn't cut carbs out of my diet right. at all. Because having glucose present is actually good for the glial cells, the immune cells in the brain. They like glucose more than ketones. Correct. Neurons like ketones more than glucose. So brain octane lets me have ketones present and glucose present at the same time. So I'm like, I think I want all energy pathways available and turned on because I just took a hit to the head. Uh, and that was you know, kind of kind of the the back of the envelope equation there. But mm -hmm. I, I really hope that message sinks in because the idea I'm never going to have a carb again, I, I find cyclical ketosis going in and out, having mild ketones present because I'm using uh, this external source from brain octane, that's what makes my brain run best for years. Whereas when I did my three months of zero carbs, I, I didn't like how I felt at the end no. of that. Like it, it wasn't right. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, all right, that, that was cool. Yeah, I agree with you on that one. So it's going to be a, a blended kind of uh, diet. So there are okay. some good carbohydrates in it. And then is mild ketosis, not extreme ketosis, as you said about being off sugar for three months. That would kill me in a day. I'm hypoglycemic <laughs> anyway, you know. Uh, you're an anti-aging doctor and hypoglycemic. Come on, you can hack that. <laughs> hey, sometimes it's genetics, you know. Oh, uh, there you go. Good excuse. Now, now we're up on up against the end of the show, and I want to ask each of you a, a question. And I, I think uh, Andrew, I'm going to ask you this question first. It's a question I've asked everyone who's been on the show, and it's based on on your life, uh, all the stuff you know, the stuff you've done. If someone came to you tomorrow and said, "Look, I want to perform better at everything I do as a human being." What are the three most important pieces of advice you have to offer me? Like, like what, what are three things that matter most? Well, Dave, um, great question. My experience as a Special Forces Green Beret has taught me that in situations of life and death, there's no time to sit and contemplate a response. Okay? You will default to your most foundational level of training. My suffering, as it turns out, was ultimately self-chosen and uh, my dad unwittingly gave me some great advice. And he said, son, I can't understand everything that you've been through. And I know you're hurting. But if you could find a way to make your new mission in life about somebody else, helping somebody else, well, then I think you'll find that will be able to help you. You know, and I took that and I molded it into you know, what we did with the book is which we wanted to give this message to other people who are traveling similar terrain. And what I found through that, Dave, is one, if you want to come out of trauma, physical trauma or suffering, you need to decide to live a life worth living. For me, that was decide to live a life worth living again. From there, you need to define your life's purpose, your mission, your why. It's going to be personal to you. And it is a solo mission. And if you can figure out your why, then you need to determine your how. You need to figure out how you can plan, prepare, and perform to the best of your abilities when the situation calls for. I think Nietzsche said that uh, if you have a big enough why, you'll always find the how. I found that to be true in my life, both as a Green Beret and post-Green Beret. And lastly, dedicate yourself to something bigger than yourself. I was uh, bruised, I was battered, I was bloody, left for dead, labeled through the VA as 100% disabled with 32 disabilities. It started with a decision, and then it turned into a thought and habits. We are our thoughts and our habits. So that's the process that I put to turn my life around, and then with Mark to help 
us to bring that same level of healing to others. So that would be my recommendation, Dave. Uh, beautiful, and, and thank you for, for your service, both military and what you're doing now. Um, it, it makes a difference. Thank you. And now uh, you mentioned your book. Is it available yet? Yeah, Tales from the Blast Factory. Uh, we re, uh, the publisher did the did the name, which I think is pretty good. It's available uh, through ebook right now on Amazon, and the uh, paperback will be out in January of 2018. And is there a URL people should go to? Yeah, to learn more about that. Tales from the Blast Factory dot com, and uh, we just sold the movie rights, so we'll be doing a documentary film on that first, and then we'll look at it doing a feature film later. Uh, awesome. So you guys know where to go to get that book and to check it out. Uh, it sounds like it's going to be great. I haven't had a chance to look at it yet. I'll get you a copy. All right. Thank you. Now, Mark, same question. I want to perform better everything that it is to be a human being. What are the three most important things I need to know? Great question, obviously. Three most important things to know is yourself. You have to have a sense of what you, how you feel well and how to attain that sense of well-being by either meditation, nutrition, making sure your hormones are correct. And to make sure that as you are learning the skills or the knowledge of how to be better, to share it. What I do is about sharing that knowledge freely to people who can go and take it and to embellish, passing it on, pay it forward. And lastly is meditation, calmness, appreciating that things will go wrong in our life and that we shouldn't be so overly reactive to it. Step back and take a minute and see how we can improve the situation to embellish the situation so the person who you're interacting with understands that there's a better way and there's always a better way. So we have to make a difference by being the difference. I absolutely love it. Now, where can people find out more about your work? Uh, what's the best place for them? Uh, the best place is uh, www.tbi, traumatic brain injury, tbi, med legal, M E D L E G A L dot com. And that has all the information, a couple of hundred articles. So people who want to read a little bit more go there and get it. Um, they can get access to the book and pretty, I think I'll have in the next week, there'll be the first chapter of the book, uh, traumatic brain injury will be posted so they can download it. It's the first chapter is an overview of the whole book, chapter by chapter. So if you want an abbreviated read of the book, you just read chapter one. Awesome. So there's a ton of info for people listening. And the one thing I haven't asked is if uh, people feel called to support the Warrior Angels Foundation, which is helping uh, veterans come back from these TBIs, uh, where can people learn more? Where can they donate? Uh, what, what's, the, what's the story? Yeah, there? thanks, Dave. We appreciate that. They can get uh, our information, all of our social media and everything through www.warriorsoulagoge.com. That's A-G-O-G-E.com. Everything they could ever want is on that website. Beautiful. Well, guys, I think you've added a, a huge amount of value today, uh, just letting people understand how prevalent brain injuries are in society, the, the story of, of you know, where it can take you from being an extreme high performer to what the hell just happened, uh, and then how to come back from that is, is profoundly cool. And uh, contextualizing hormones as, as part of the brain, uh, part of brain function, not just mm -hmm. part of, of muscles, is, is profoundly important. Uh, just for everyone listening to understand. So I, I'm really grateful. I, I had a fantastic time chatting with you guys. And thanks for being on Bulletproof Radio. Thank you, Dave. Been Thank you, great. Dave. Appreciate it. If you enjoyed today's episode, you know what to do. Actually, there's a lot of things you could do. You go to bulletproof.com slash iTunes, which will take you right to the iTunes page to leave a review of this episode where you can leave five stars and say, this is worth my time because that's what the show is about, is, is about you and about doing stuff that, that's worth an hour of your time. You could also go out there and check out uh, the books or the websites uh, that our two guests today uh, just mentioned and consider picking one up. If you're a doctor uh, or you know you have TBI in your family or you have it yourself, you might even want to pick up a medical textbook. You don't have to know everything and every word. There's enough in there that you can go, wait, uh, now I know enough to go in and meet with my doctor who probably hasn't even read this book and ask the right questions and to demand the right treatment and to demand the right lab panels and things like that. It's your right to do that. 
you're the guy who writes the check to your doctor. And if your doctor says they won't order an, an inflammation panel when you know you hit yourself in the head, there's a very simple two words that you have at your disposal. And those words are, you're fired. I've used them with doctors and it's okay for you to do that. And if you're a doctor listening and that offends you, I apologize. Read the damn books so no one will ever say that to you, all right? Thanks everyone. <laughs> awesome. Right on, right on.